the three valves. Okay, good. One, two, three. There we go. All right. Good afternoon. I'm Charles Shapiro, the president of World Affairs Council of Atlanta. Our program today is Putin's Russia, a conversation with Dr. Fiona Hill. The program is brought to you by the members of the World Affairs Council of Atlanta. If you'd like to join the council or make a contribution to support programming like this, that would be delightful. I want to give a special welcome to our board members who are on this program today. With us, Paige Alexander, Joe Bancoff, Eric Joyner, and Jim Reed. Former U.S. Ambassadors, Mary Ann Peters and Lisa Kovisky. Nagesh Singh, the Chief of Protocol from the Indian Ministry of External Affairs, is joining us from New Delhi. And I've got some old friends on here, Phil Gunson from the International Crisis Group, Michael Ard and John Davis, both of whom I had the honor of serving with in Venezuela, Jeff Rosenspeig from the Boys Weta School, and Amit Bozer. And we've got people joining us from the World Affairs Councils of Connecticut, San Diego, South Texas, Northern Michigan, Colorado Foothills, and the California Desert. Uh, to ask questions at about 12.30, 12.35, well, I'll take questions from the audience, but we're gonna use the Q&A function, not the chat. Please keep your questions short and use your name. I won't ask anonymous questions. Uh, so here's the intro. Dr. Fiona Hill is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution. From 2017 to 2019, she was deputy assistant to the president and senior director for European and Russian affairs on the National Security Council staff. From 2006 to 2009, she served as National Intelligence Officer for Russia and Eurasia at the National Intelligence Council. Dr. Hill was a witness in the November 2019 impeachment hearings. She was awarded her PhD in history from Harvard University. And maybe most importantly, her new book, There Is Nothing For You Here, Finding Opportunity in the 21st Century, comes out the first week of October. Dr. Hill. Welcome to the World Affairs Council. It's a pleasure having you. Oh, it's great to be here, Charles. And I'm actually amazed by all the places that people are, are zooming in from. So I hope that everybody's um, out there is doing well. And I imagine, you know, kind of um, in some places, but out in California, there's a bit of a tricky situation there right now. So I sort of send my condolences and hope everyone's staying safe. That's great. And we're sending everybody the link to where you can pre-order the book. So uh, hopefully this will be a profitable hour for you. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, I have a coaching book as well, but the new book is, uh, you know, obviously <laughs> kind of a bit of Okay, let me ask you a question. If, if oil is back at near $70 a barrel, the Taliban appear to be on the verge of victory in, Af in Afghanistan, the U.S. is we're all busy arguing over masks and vaccinations, the U.K. has left the EU and Angela Merkel will soon depart office in Germany. If you're sitting in the Kremlin, how, how does that correlation of forces look to you? Well, if you're Mr. Putin, you know, there's always some opportunity in a crisis. And as he showed, um, you know, back in 2016, when he decided to unleash the Russian security forces to interfere in our election, you know, he surveyed the US political scene, saw that, you know, our politics were pretty partisan and contentious and saw an opportunity to do some meddling you know, hoping that that might kind of pay a few dividends for Russia down the line. You know, I'm sure we'll talk about that over the course of um, this discussion that it probably didn't play out exactly as he hoped. So he's looking at this right now and, and looking at the same thing. Germany, um, a changeover from Angela Merkel, someone, you know, who hasn't always been his bestie. Uh, you know, she uh, was someone who came from the Eastern Bloc. He probably had some high hopes early on, was a Russian speaker, you know, someone from sort of his generation, a little bit younger, but... Um, you know, probably thought someone who grew up in East Germany might have some sensitivities that would play in his favor. You know, we're all arguing about the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, which, you know, might indicate that, you know, there was some predilection to doing, um, you know, more with um, Russia, not just in terms of uh, the economics, but also the politics. But of course, Angela Merkel has proven to be very problematic for Putin. Right. So he's probably now thinking, great, there's no um, evident successor. What can I do, you know, to tip uh, the scales perhaps in um we get a russian favor there we're going to order the likely candidates brexit similar sort of thing i mean the the russian um uk uh, relationship is is now pretty fraught i mean a lot of that is to do with uh, thank you again mr putin for deciding to unleash the hit squads from the gru the um russian intelligence services to try to take out a series of former spies um in um london mr litvinenko first of all with polonium 
and then uh, Mr. Skripal and his daughter with um, a, a novel nerve agent in uh, March of 2018, Novichok, which could have wiped out a small town in, uh, in England. I mean, that doesn't exactly endear you to, uh, you know, the, the UK. He's always looking there to see, you know, kind of what advantage can be gained because there's an awful lot of Russians with a lot of investments in, um, in the UK. Right now, just for um, a heads up for people, there's a very interesting court case going through London because the Russians have really banked a lot of their money there. They've hired uh, a lot of high class um, London barristers to represent their interests. They've got houses all over the place. You know, if you walk down some of the main streets in London, you're more likely to hear Russian than English these days. Uh, you know, a lot of the before the pandemic, a lot of the um, luxury goods catered towards Russians and Russian oligarchs and their families going to all of the famous schools and universities. Um, but um, some of the oligarchs close to Putin are suing um, a journalist from the Financial Times, Catherine Belton, who wrote a book called Putin's People. The book is about this thick mm -hmm. and it's kind of Catherine Belton's, you know, kind of life's work of investigative journalism, looking at the way that the, you know, the kind of Russian financial system and political system work and are meshed together and all these connections between Putin and the people who own and run Russia. And they're suing her through the um, London courts for libel for things that actually can be quite easily proved to be correct. But that is, you know, showing there that, you know, Putin's thinking, you know, how can I, you know, basically, you know, maneuver things around to make it very difficult for people to put, you know, kind of the London based assets under pressure. So basically, the bottom line is, if you're Vladimir Putin, you're always trying to kind of see what advantage you can get out of circumstances that may be detrimental to others. The problem is, of course, that's massive uncertainty for you too. All of those things that you've talked about that you laid out there, the pandemic, also climate change, frankly, and these extreme weather events, Russia is on fire right now. And, I, and although I don't want to minimize at all what's happening in California and the West, Siberia, there are fires raging in Siberia that are even larger in dimensions than the fires we currently have in uh, the United States. And they're also kind of racing through parts of Siberia where it's not just melting permafrost that we're worrying about with methane emissions, but where you have these ancient peat bogs. And for all of you, you know, kind of who know anything about, you know, geology and biology, you know, peat is an incredible dense concentration of fuel up in Scotland, you know, where my ancestors, you know, some of them came from, they used to put peat on their fires, you know, and peat can burn for a millennia, you know, basically. So uh, Putin has a big set of problems on his hands. He's looking, you know, in some respects, to divert away attention domestically to all the problems abroad, saying, well, you know, we don't have that many problems. Look at these guys. And this is disaster over there. But he also is looking to, you know, continue to have a managed confrontation with us to mobilize people behind him. Because in this time of uncertainty, he's saying, I'm the solution. I want to be president. I intend to be president pretty much in perpetuity. He's extended the term limits. He can be president until 2036 in theory why which time he will be 84 and you know kind of i suppose he could do it again if this works out so he's got a lot going on um he's looking for just quickly summing up opportunity out of crisis but he's also worried himself about how things might play out at home and can you separate putin from the russian state are they one in the same well, you can, but he's trying to, um, you know, basically uh, make himself inseparable. One of his uh, chief advisors at one point had this pretty famous quote, without um, Putin, there's no Russia. And, yeah. you know, basically the idea being that he is the embodiment of the state. And this is sometimes reflected in political polling. You know, we often say, well, Putin remains pretty popular, but then actually you look at the polling about the government and the way that people feel about the state affairs in the country, and it's pretty starkly critical. You know, you're not by any um, stretch in a kind of a majority of people in support of the Russian system and government, and lots of complaints about, you know, various aspects of governance. But when you look at Putin, he seems, you know, generally popular, not how he did after the annexation of Crimea, where his popularity was stratospheric, you know, back in 2014 when they annexed Crimea, up in the 80s, you know, the 90s, even people who were harsh critics of his, this was so popular regaining and reclaiming Russian, you know, kind of historic lands that then, um, you know, he, he really bolstered himself. It's not been anywhere like that since. But a lot of people do see him as the symbol of the state. So that when they're asked by poll pollsters, you know, what do you think of Putin? It's like saying, well, what do you think about Russia? What do you think about the Russian flag? Or, you know, what do you feel about your own kind of Russian identity? And so they tend to have this kind of basic response of being, you know, generally supportive. 
But in actual fact, when you, as I said, you start to drill down, there is a lot more sort of separation of Putin from the state. And the more that he's in office, um, you know, the more difficult it becomes to be constantly rebranding himself. He's been there 20, you know, one, you know, years coming up. And he's, he's planning on another 15, you know. So, I mean, there's every likelihood that he could pull this off. But, you know, for many, he'll be, it'll become really stale. And there's a lot of people would like their own chance um, at the presidency, but also their own chance to move up in the system. And, you know, kind of more variety and a, a, a question about where is this all going in the future? And Putin's just saying, me, <laughs> more me and me again. It, the, the, according to World Bank data, the Russian... Russian economy is slightly smaller than Canada's or South Korea's and a bit larger than Brazil's. Um, and, and it's not growing. I mean, what is going on there? And there must be economic constraints on what the Russians can do, whether it's Ukraine or Syria or Cuba and Venezuela. Well, I think there's two aspects to that question there, Charles. I mean, it's a really great one because, I mean, a lot of uh, time we're always debating, you know, both people who look at Russia, but also people in governments. Well, you know, aren't they in decline? And can't we just wait them out? Won't they just kind of fade away? It's not just, you know, the population decline, but, you know, all of these factors that you're laying out. But if you look across the sweep of Russian history, you see that Russia's always been in this kind of what seems like a precarious uh, place, if you start looking at the classic power mm. indices, the size of the economy, the size of the military, you know, this, that, and the other, you know, depending on, you know, whatever sector in the past where people um, had this kind of sense of what encapsulated or what defined power. But then you look at what Russia is able to do with what seem to be limited resources, and they're able to do a lot. And in terms of, um, you know, back in the Soviet period, you know, we saw them uh, first man in space, satellite, Sputnik, you know, you name it. Mm -hmm. They were also able to marshal uh, resources to create a massive conventional army, um, a, a really, um, you know, sophisticated and, you know, existentially threatening strategic nuclear arsenal. They can always mobilize resources. Now, their population has, of course, declined. In 1900, Russia and the Russian Empire had the fastest growing population in the world. Now, you know, we're more talking about population decline than anything else, you know, 100 you know, odd years on. But I think that, you know, um, that, that, in, that in itself also masks, uh, you know, what's possible. Russia has, uh, for many you know, as obviously uh, since the 1970s be, been developing oil and gas resources and mm -hmm. the booms in Russia's kind of more recent uh, economic history have been because of the increasing oil prices. I mean, you mentioned before, was it $17 a barrel? You know, kind of, a, I think that's what you said a bit earlier. 70, 70. 70, 70, sorry, 70. But, you know, in um, 2000 and um, actually, but the, the point of 17, the mistake that I made just then is that, yeah. you know, when the um, Soviet Union collapsed, and then when Boris Yeltsin was in power, it was more like $17 a right. month. So, the, and then Putin kind of came in and the prices started to rise. And, and, and the peak of kind of Russia's power and perhaps, you know, Putin's presidencies was just before the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, when oil was about $150 a month. Right. You know, so twice as much as it is now. But the Russian economy can do pretty well at lower oil prices. In fact, the $70 a barrel isn't, a particularly low oil price. The problem is the future, right? It's kind of where are we all going with hydrocarbons? And all countries, you know, including our own, that have had, you know, a major part of our economy dependent on oil and gas and oil and gas production and the usage of oil and gas, um, you know, within the economic system uh, are rethinking, you know, about um, the future. Um, all the debates we have in the car um, industry about hybrid cars, clean hydrogen, all kinds of other renewable fuels. And Russia's kind of a bit behind the curve here because this is a country that is really dependent on natural resources, all of which one way or another, you know, release um, carbon dioxide and also methane, you know, the associated gas and the rest of it. So, you know, Russia- And, and, and Russia is actually the second largest supplier of foreign oil to the United States. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, that kind of, that was something that all slipped by us, wasn't it? Because yeah. of course, this is a global market and it comes from all kinds of, you know, different uh, directions here. And so, you know, this is a problem for Russia in the future because what's happened in the Russian system is that oil and gas revenues have mostly gone to the state. The state's had a very high taxes and it's used the revenues, the state revenues for a lot of investment in other sectors. So other sectors have been actually heavily subsidized. 
we used to talk, you know, back in the day about the Dutch disease when um, the Dutch economy really suffered because um, oil and gas prices were really boosted and there was more investment in oil and gas and other sectors got neglected. But, you know, with the Russians, they've actually taken and extracted money out of the oil and gas sectors and invested it elsewhere in the economy through um, a pretty, you know, high taxation regime. And so there's a lot of questions now whether that economic model can continue. So diversification. And how do you diversify when you've got a pretty top heavel heavy oligarchical class and not much of a, in a way of entrepreneurs. The recent um, ruling on Michael Calvey, the British, the, sorry, the American, he did, spent some time in the UK as well, but the American businessman who is an investor in Russia since the 1990s from Bering Vostok, basically finding him guilty of a pretty much manufactured crime, really puts, um, I think, a lot of um, stress on the idea of attracting in more foreign direct investment for innovation and for you know fueling the economy in the future so this is a real dilemma here i think you know the, the way that putin runs the system with this you know top heavy oligarchical class tied around him you know uh, focus on the very heavy hand of the state or the grabbing hand of people close to the state <laughs> into all of the different uh, economic assets makes it quite difficult to figure out where they're going to go from here so there is a challenge but I would also just say, from what I said earlier, don't count them out yeah. because the Russians are always able to find a way of mobilizing assets and mobilizing resources to secure their most important political priorities. And, you know, as we see, you know, now with uh, ransomware attacks, cyber attacks, you know, those can be done on the cheap. And there's a lot of, you know, subversive covert activity, assassinations and all kinds of other things that, you know, Russia can create a lot of problems to leverage attention, you know, to kind of bring people to the negotiating table to talk about things without having to spend a lot of money. Yeah. I mean, and the, and the ransomware business appears to be a boom business in Russia. Do, are we right to blame the government of Russia for not controlling ransomware attacks? Are these people like the Nigerian princes who are asking for money on in your email? Well, I think there's some of that. And actually, we're also worried about the government of Nigeria and others who, you know, allow these things to happen. And, you know, we spend a lot of time ourselves trying to, you know, go after cybercrime. But look, um, you know, as I said, the Russians can do a lot of things on the cheap through, you know, non-conventional forces. And there's a lot of linkages here with the Russian you know, military and security services. So for example, um, there's a guy called Yevgeny Prigozhin that some of um, you know, the um, participants might have heard of. He's the guy who used to be um, the catering head of the company that uh, serviced the Kremlin. And um, he also set up the Internet Research Agency, which was instrumental in the intervention in our elections in 2016 and continues to be, you know, in terms of creating false personas on the Internet and, you know, kind of mayhem in your social media. A lot of the, you know, the ads you might be getting might be coming from, you know, people working there who are pretending to be Americans, you know, inflaming all of the hotspots in our culture wars or in our debates about guns and abortion and, you know, kind of all these, um, you know, uh, in inflammatory um, statements that keep getting circulated around Russian bots and also, you know, real Russians, you know, working for this internet research agency. But he's also the head of something called the Wagner Group, where he set this up, which is a paramilitary organization. Um, but, I mean, basically uh, recruiting former uh, Russian special forces, paying them, you know, pretty high salary, and then deploying them all the way around the world in the service of uh, the Russian government. These are the guys who tussled with American special forces out in Syria. Again, in 2018, where people might recall in the press, it was a very nasty firefight because the um, US special forces were fired upon. And it turned out that these were not um, Syrian rebels as had been assumed in the um, uh, aftermath, uh, but um, were the Russian um, servicemen from the Wagner Group. That is the first exchange of fire on a massive scale that we've ever had with the Russians or the Soviets even in the Cold War and, you know, several hundred uh, casualties on the uh, Wagner group side, pretty, you know, shocking incident. And that's why, you know, kind of we look on the cyber front, <clears throat> you know, it's very likely that some of these ransomware attacks are kind of ransomware attacks for hire, just like you have these other paramilitary organizations or these assassination hit squads. And then there is another <clears throat> element of people just not being reined in because the chaos that they create is useful. 
it's useful mm -hmm. to kind of create leverage because the Russians want to be at the table talking to the United States about rules of the road in the cyber domain. And they can point to these ransomware actors that they're not reining in and say, look, well, we've got to commonly tackle this problem. And um, it's also interesting that a lot of these ransomware attacks have coding to prevent them from going on systems that use Cyrillic as their base. Ah. So, well, you know, when um, you yeah. can, there's a lot of coverage about this in the press, but it's kind of clear that they're being encouraged if they're, you know, kind of not being given a, you know, wink and a nod, they're just being pushed out of doing anything at home and just watching kind of what the reaction is abroad and whether there's getting back to the question you had before about all of this chaos, whether then the, an opportunity comes out of that to get, you know, agreements and formalized treaties even with the United States or NATO or other adversaries so that you can also then prevent the, um, those sort of things happening to you. But it's basically Russia saying, well, look, we have, it's like terrorism. The Russians did this with terrorists as well. Basically saying we need to have this counter-terrorism cooperation, but they didn't really rein in, you know, kind of many of the groups that we were hoping that they would. To what extent are Russia and China aligned? Are they actively working in tandem and coordinating their policies? I think they are on many fronts now. And if, uh, I would say that from my perspective, that was a bit of a surprise from years ago. I wouldn't have predicted mm -hmm. such a close relationship, honestly. But I think a lot of this is what we've done too. I mean, one of the problems that we have is I think we don't always fully look. And even as I'm depicting, you know, the kind of the relationship are depicting Russia, you know, in response to your questions, it's a pretty complex situation. We have to remember here that Russia has a very strong sense of threat emanating from us because we have capabilities and capacities and you know, all kinds of um, conventional and nuclear and other missiles, of course, that could obliterate Russia. We may not have the intent to do that, but for the Russians, that doesn't matter. The Russian you know, word for security, biezapasnost, actually means without danger. So mm -hmm. their sense of family security is removing all dangers, which of course you can't. And whenever we've actually tried to convince them, look, we're not doing what we did before. We're not in a geopolitical competition with you. We don't want to carve up Europe. We don't actually want to, you know, um, expel you from the Kremlin. They don't believe it because Putin's looked at what the United States did in, you know, moving into Iraq and, um, you know, in the, um, you know, <clears throat> wake of the whole kind of crisis over weapons of mass destruction. The Russians knew that um, Saddam Hussein didn't have any. So they assumed that this was just purely about regime change. Um, you know, it was moving into um, Afghanistan, of course, you know, kind of they'd done that as well. But a lots of the things that we've done, they've looked at it and thought, well, look, you guys are in the business of regime change. This is it's what you do. So, you know, Putin is always convinced that we're out to get him. And, you know, of course, there's a lot of rhetoric from lots of um, circles here in the United States that sort of certainly suggest that, you know, sure. we're not big fans. You know? <laughs> so he has reason to feel uncomfortable about this. So his view is that, um, you know, we have to be marginalized as much as possible. Now, what about China? Similar, right? I mean, China has benefited immensely from the relationship with the United States. Its economy has burgeoned and um, really kind of grown immensely since the global financial crisis, while the United States has, you know, weakened relative to China. China has not just regional ambitions, but some global ambitions. And China also feels that it's been pushed back uh, by the United States. And it wasn't just through the Trump administration, but now the Biden administration, you know, the rhetoric has really escalated and uh, increased. And China, you know, feels under siege from US sanctions and US pressure. I mean, how they see it. And so- sure, So they both China, have a common enemy. Yeah, Russia and China feel like they're on the same page here. And whatever right. differences they have, which are you know, quite a few and certainly historic, they are feeling that there is a real benefit to their mutual benefit from working closely together, be it the United Nations, be it trying to push back against the United States sanctions, be it exploring cryptocurrencies and other ways of avoiding, you know, the weaponization of the dollar that, you know, through you know, all of the various instruments that we deploy from Treasury, etc. And, you know, kind of uh, they also feel that we impinge on their regional ambitions. So, you know, why not work together? There's much more reason to work together than not at the moment. Down the line, I think that Russia's making a mistake, honestly, because <clears throat> just like, um, you know, the rest of us, the over, you know, bearing dominance of China economically and militarily could become problematic for Russia. I mean, I don't want to see us in the kind of Cold War standoff with China that, you know, we, we had with uh, the Soviet Union in the past. And I do think that there are different ways of managing 
you know, this complex and confrontational relationship and trying to, you know, kind of put it on a different track. But, you know, kind of for the Russians, a world that is completely dominated by China also eclipses them. And so, you know, there are some dangers for them down the line, particularly as the fact is they've had territorial disputes in the past. But right now, I don't think China's, uh, Russia sees that. I think Russia sees much more benefit in bandwagoning, aligning with uh, China. And the relationship is becoming, you know, more strategic in many aspects, military cooperation. And, you know, the only aspect that I think is really missing for Russia there, I mean, a major aspect is that China is not really going to be helping with Russia's own modernization because China is more interested in trade of Russian raw materials. So you're not going to get a lot of innovation, you know, in the Russian system coming from China. Hmm. Yesterday, and uh, Andrei Kortunov, who's the chair of the Russian International Affairs Council, in an interview with TASS, essentially flipped his finger at U.S. and European sanctions against Russia as a country and against Russian individuals. Um, said they'll have zero impact on Russian foreign policy. Are there better tools to deal with Russia and Putin? I mean, where do the U.S. and the West have leverage? Well, what, um, uh, I know Andrei Kozinov um, really well, by the way, I mean, for decades. I think what he's essentially saying here is, look, this isn't the way that they change their behavior or their goals, right, in terms of where they want to go in foreign policy. And that's absolutely accurate. Sanctions do create a lot of pain and they reduce a lot of options. So in, in some respects, they work, but not necessarily to change the goals of foreign policy. What they do is change the means in which the Russians try to achieve those goals. It's like, you know, water and finding a different, you know, channel. So if one avenue is cut off or is sanctioned, they'll look for something else. And that's why people get so frustrated because if the um, uh, sanctions are, in, are intended to change behavior and the behavior is tied to the pursuit of goals, then that's not gonna work. It might change some of the things they do, but the general behavior of, you know, kind of feeling aggressive and trying to, you know, kind of eliminate threat, like I said before, to try to eliminate all danger isn't gonna change. So that's kind of basically what he's saying. So what are we, but the, so then we have to think about what are we trying to do with these sanctions? You know, we don't want them to go out there and assassinate people. You know, like Mr. Skripal or Litvinenko or shooting people in the tear garden in uh, Germany or to hack into our systems. Well, we also know that there's a specific sets of people who do that. So we can go after them by, you know, through sanctions, trying to like Mr. Prigozhi, put him on the sanctions list and you try to kind of make sure he doesn't have any, ability to have any Western business or Western assets, but it probably doesn't anyway. Uh, and so, you know, that doesn't seem particularly effective, but what you can then do is try to think about, well, how can you roll up his opportunity to actually do some of these um, activities? So in response, for example, to the poisoning of Mr. Skripal, we try to expel uh, the intelligence operatives that we knew were involved in this. We try to get all the other countries to work with us to expel them from our countries and then make it mm -hmm. impossible for them to come back. We didn't really succeed. The United States got rid of 60 people. The Brits got rid of 23, which were the, the hit squads. But we couldn't get the rest of our European counterparts and others to go along with us on a massive scale because they were kind of thinking this was like tit for tat expulsions during the Cold War, which it wasn't. And we were trying to say to message the Russians, look, we want to have a good diplomatic relationship with you, but we don't want all these guys running around killing people. You know, we need that to can we cease and desist on this? And one way is just to block them and not let them you know, back in the country. So I mean, that's kind of one thing. The other thing is what I mentioned before about this um, case where the um, London courts are allowing Russian oligarchs to go after Catherine Belton and other journalists and business people and things like this. We can stop that. This is like getting our own legal system in order. Mm -hmm. We have loads of, um, you know, basically possibilities for Russians to just park their money and I don't mean any Russians I mean if people here who are listening who are regular Russian citizens and regular Russian businessmen there are a lot but I mean the people who are being directed by the Kremlin to have their um, or, or allow their companies to be used as fronts for this intelligence activity and there are a lot of people out there who have that we have a lot of information on it we can stop them from having investments in in our country we can close up the loopholes we also have to work on our own um, corruption, frankly, because a lot of the way that the Russians have influence is just for buying influence, buying people, political parties. We know a lot about what they do. 
But with that, a lot of that requires cleaning up our own act. And so through Congress, there's been bipartisan legislation through the NDAA, the National Defense Authorization Act, to do some of this mm -hmm. and as a kind of cleanup. I mean, we have so many places. I mean, Miami, Delaware, New York, Washington, D.C. I mean, you name it, kind of places where shell companies, um, frankly, people I've worked with in government go out and become advocates and, you know, register themselves as foreign agents, you know, to advocate for Russian companies, you know, that we know are also have acted at times as fronts for subversive activity. Well, perhaps, you know, they could stop doing that. I'm often shocked by some of the people that I've, you know, worked with who had security clearances at the highest level. The next thing I know, a shilling for, you know, kind of a major Russian company that we know that the kind of the people who are affiliated with it have been doing stuff for the Kremlin. And are trying to buy influence. But the free enterprise system at its to, worst, yeah. Yeah, and there's actually a book coming out with a young um, investigative journalist um, in, I think, just a couple of months that I got an opportunity to read an advanced copy of American uh, Kleptocracy, and it goes through all of this. But I mean, we know this, and there's lots of material out there. Members of Congress know it. Members of Congress themselves have to clean up their act and be careful about where they get money from. But you know, while we have so much money sloshing around in our system creating political action committees and everything, the Russians kind of have lots of pathways in. So we have to think long and hard about how we basically batten down the hatches at home. It's like a kind of, you know, rising sea levels. You know, we, we take precautions. Well, we have to do that against, you know, floods of, of dirty money, you know, coming in. Michael Ard from Johns Hopkins asked the following, at, at, at what point, what should a correct relationship between Russia and the United States look like? I mean, you know, it's a great question in terms of what kind of correct. I mean, we really hoped, and I think Michael, you know, will obviously remember this back in, you know, the 1990s after the collapse of the Soviet Union, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, that we could, you know, put this relationship on a different footing. You know, expectations were raised, you know, perhaps somewhat misplaced in what we thought was possible. We've, we've had a whole catalog of misunderstandings on both sides, you know, back and forth despite, you know, kind of good intent. I mean, again, we mentioned Andrew Kortanov before. I mean, he and I and many others have worked for years on trying to kind of find ways of having, you know, constructive engagement and talking about, you know, our foreign policy differences, um, you know, in normal settings like this, you know, for example. I mean, the problem that we have right now is just, is there's the nature of this um, kind of system where you have someone in the Kremlin who was a former, you know, black ops guy. You know, that's why the book that I wrote about Putin with Cliff Gaddy was cooperative in the Kremlin. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we have some of our own you know, politicians who, let's just say, haven't behaved in the best possible ways. But it's very different. We have somebody who was trained, you know, to basically do black ops and, you know, honey traps and blackmail and manipulation. And, you know, just makes that a matter of course. And I know the cynical among us might say, well, isn't that just politics? Well, you know, I think he's kind of stepped into a, a kind of a realm that normal you know, politicians, you know, don't. Uh, and, uh, you know, kind of uh, usually uh, step into. So a correct relationship would be taking that out mm -hmm. and, and going back to, you know, regular diplomacy. I mean, I'm not saying that we can get back to that idea of a partnership with Russia or, you know, kind of a relationship that was going on a trajectory that was going to, you know, put us in a different place. I think well, there's always going to be confrontational elements because we see things quite differently in the world. But I think in a kind of a, a, a regular relationship, diplomatic, where we're managing our confrontations, taking the heat down, managing our expectations, but managing, you know, the risk of clashing is, is really what we should be aiming for. I think, you know, Biden is trying to articulate this. A lot of people have been cynical about it. Well, you're not going to get to a stable, predictable relationship. But there are certain places where we could stabilize things. We're not just kind of careening from one crisis to the next. And there can be predictability in having diplomatic meetings, regular meetings, like we do with other countries, for example. Right. I mean, even with China, you know, we haven't quite, I mean, things with China are probably not going in the best direction, but we have managed to maintain dialogue and, you know, kind of discussion with them. And I am a, a firm believer in diplomacy. And I think, you know, where we're able to deploy diplomatic tools, and it's not just, you know, out there to, you know, one sanction after the next and just refusing to meet with them. The other thing is, I think it's going to be very difficult to build back up again our diplomatic relationship because of what I said before. I mean, I'm sure everyone's familiar with now, we've almost had the kind of collapse of our um, uh, embassy in Moscow because we used to hire a very large number of um, local um, 
uh, local staff to do a lot of consular work and a lot of the work within the embassy. For all the you know, scrutiny that the State Department gets and the Foreign Service offices, and as we know, and we have a number of former ambassadors here, the Foreign Service is really tiny. The number of FSOs, I can't even remember the number, is, but it's in the, you know, the low thousands for a global footprint. Right. And so you know, when Russia says you can't hire people locally, it doesn't just half the embassy, it kind of brings it down to pretty much the skeleton staff because all of the embassy security and drivers and things were recruited locally. Now, the Russians never do that because, of course, like I said, they tend to emphasize intelligence <laughs> over diplomacy. If you're just doing regular diplomacy, you know, you wouldn't care quite so much. But the Russians, it's all it's all just the their staff and their families get hired. They don't kind of take on anybody locally. But that's how the United States operates from, you know, Moscow, you know, to London, to, you know, Brussels, you know, you name it. So now we have a real problem because we can't actually carry out the consular relationships that we would visas and everything else. So a correct relationship would be a proper agreement on diplomacy. But I don't think, you know, to be um, blunt, that we're gonna get anywhere fast in the next couple of years because of the political um, cycle. Because Putin has to put himself up for re-election in 2024. I mean, we may already know the outcome, mm. but you know, he still has to have some form of presidential campaign, some kind of opposition, unless we're just going to have it rubber stamped for legitimacy purposes. And so 2024 is coming up fast, as we know. We've got the you same you know, cycle here. And we've got our midterms in 2022. They've got the kind of equivalent of the parliamentary elections this September. So like what, a month or so from now. And the ruling party, United Russia, though Putin's not part of it, um, theoretically, or well, um, actually in principle, um, isn't very popular. And they might not, you know, without a lot of effort and manipulation, you know, get the kind of results that they want in the in the Russian parliament. And so Putin's doing a lot of mobilization against external enemies, but he also wants to keep us out of the mix. So he doesn't probably want a lot of American diplomats running around going, oh, well, what's happening here? You know, kind yeah. of on the Russian political front doesn't want pieces in the New York Times and Washington Post that can, you know, kind of come back home. And he's taking some really extreme steps. It's not just having Alexei Navalny in prison you know, to keep him out of the political fray, but it's closing down, you know, educational relationships, things like Bard College, which is just absurd. All these, you know, kind of um, other actions that we hear them doing about, you know, going after the media. So it's basically, he's trying to make sure that there are nothing left to chance and no external influence whatsoever in this political cycle. Why, why does he see Navalny as such a threat? Well, Navalny is a threat. So, um, so first of all, Navalny is a populist, just like Putin. Putin is really a populist. He's kind of, you know, trying to sort of unify the country again around himself um, and you know, push off any kind of external problems. But he does it by pure populist um, positions. He isn't really a part of the United Russia Party. He doesn't really have a platform except himself and making Russia great again. You know, familiar. Um, it's kind of all about, you know, the sort of, propaganda tools, the posturing, the charismatic personality being something for everyone. I mean, it's just a kind of a classic populist play. Earlier on in his presidencies, I would say that that was quite different. You know, he was really tackling reforms and in the economy. You know, once he annexed Crimea, it was kind of in a different phase. It was, you know, bringing back territory, you know, stressing Russian history. You know, he's taken to having articles written, I doubt he wrote it himself, about, you know, kind of Ukraine's part of Russia, and he did that before, actually, in 2012 as well, mm. you know, head of annexation of Crimea. It's just he's kind of playing in a totally different space, and Navalny's in that same space. Navalny's mm. a Russian patriot, he's a Russian nationalist, in a, you know, kind of a, a general sense. He's younger, he's handsome, he's very charismatic, he's fantastically telegenic, he's super smart, and he's got a lot of people you know, even if they don't support him per se, but they also want to see change. And he's not asking for a Russian revolution. This is not Lenin or Trotsky. He just wants these guys gone, to give the younger mm -hmm. people a chance. He wants the corrupt kleptocrats out of office and a new generation of people coming in. He's not saying that he's going to change the direction of Russian foreign policy or even, you know, kind of change the state and the state structure. Just going to get rid of the corrupt oligarchs and the kleptocrats and give everybody else a chance and more pluralism. You know, so it's a kind of an appeal that um, isn't suggesting anything massively radical, just sort of a change of people, getting rid of Putin's people, which is probably why, you know, they're going after Catherine Belton and her book in London as well, because this is all part of the, you know, these guys are dragging us down. They're not preventing the, uh, presenting the future, they're just robbing us blind. 
And that's kind of Navalny's message. I remember that amazing video that he made. Uh, I'm sure yeah. people have seen it, you know. After yeah, documenting the corruption. It was fabulous. I, it too. I was like, oh, oh, my goodness. And it was so slick and well done. And, yeah. you know, just his, his sense of humor and irony. And, yeah, I'd have, if I'd been Putin, be trying to get him out of the picture. And, look, we know that he um, they tried to kill him. And he, he proved that, too. He humiliated them and embarrassed them because he used humor. You know, look, this is a guy who tried to kill me by putting, you know, stuff in my underpants. And, who, you know, look at his palace. He, he wants to spend his time in retirement watching pole dancing. You know, and he just trivializes it, makes Putin look ridiculous. And so Putin hates that. So, of course, he's scared of him because other people might go, yeah, yeah, that's right. Look at that. And look how handsome this guy is, a real Russian guy. And, you know, what does he want? He doesn't want to change, you know, the whole country and... He just, you know, get rid of these guys, get the bums out. It's a classic okay. populist play. We got a, a ton of questions coming in from the audience and not so much time left. So this, this is where I'm going to ask you to do the most difficult thing and right. very, very short answer. I'll try. Sorry, I'm kind of rabbiting on here. <laughs> no, that no, I love it. It's great. Um, so a, a couple of questions. I mean, what about Russia and Iran? Um, similar to Russia and China. I mean, they are allied because they have a, a common enemy. And does uh, what do you think of the JCPOA, the Rush, the Iran nuclear deal? I'll take the uh, JCPOA first because the Russians are really keen on the JCPOA because it's like for them another treaty with the United States, even though we know it wasn't. It was just an agreement. Yeah. The Russians kind of actually were really disappointed when we wanted to pull back because. You know, they actually wanted this agreement because it's another nuclear arms agreement. You know, it gets them in the game as one of the big nuclear powers. And it's, you know, an attempt to constrain Iran. And this is a segue into the other um, uh, part of the question, because the Russians don't want Iran having nuclear weapons either. I mean, although actually they see um, Iran as a kind of a major re regional partner, it's not quite an ally. Russia um, and Iran have a, uh, a complex historic relationship that goes, you know, kind of way back. Um, you know, with the um, bordering regions, they've had a lot of, you know, back and forth of trading territory, you know, over the centuries. Um, it's not quite the same as the relationship with China. I mean, Russia sees um, Iran as a major regional player, not kind of a larger global player in that, you know, region of the Near East, the Caspian and elsewhere. But they're not that comfortable with Iran's larger ambitions. They, they actually have a relationship with Iran that they used to sort of stabilize relations with their own Muslim population because, the vast majority of uh, Russian Muslims are Sunni, and of course, um, Iran is Shia. And you know the, the Russians know that Iran doesn't really mess about, <coughs> excuse me, and Russian religious politics. And so they see Iran as a stabilizing force, which, and of course, we don't. We see Russia as a massive, Iran as a massive destabilizing force. And then in the Middle East and Syria, I think the Russians are actually, and this might sound counterintuitive, a lot of people worried about Israel's security because over the uh, years of the Netanyahu um, premiership in um, Israel, Russia and Israel drew very close. And because of the um, Russian speaking diaspora in Israel, Russia, and again, historic ties, Russia is so different from the Soviet Union, it has a stake in Israel now. The mm -hmm. holy sites and, um, you know, lots of Russian speakers, Russian tourists there all the time. I, I was in Israel with the government for a, a meeting with the um, Russian and Israeli national security advisor with Ambassador Bolton, I was just really struck by how much the Russians and um, Israelis now have fit, or at that point felt an affinity with each other. And Russia's worried about what Iran will do to Israel. And so the JCPOA for um, uh, Russia was a way of avoiding a kind of an Iranian, Israeli, you know, um, US mm -hmm. showdown. And they <laughs> want to kind of have that in place. So it's kind of very different from the way we think about it. So we have to that just, you know, kind of say their perspective is not ours. Uh, Michael Oxman asks, how is Biden's policy towards Ukraine and Russia different from the previous administration's policy towards UK, Ukraine? Well, there's not the personal element that we all kind of unpacked at the um, first impeachment trial. Right. So there's that. <laughs> but otherwise, I mean, in terms of the, you know, the, the larger, because it's not just the kind of the policy of the administration, it's how Congress thinks and, you know, kind of what the general, you know, viewpoints out there. I mean, behind the, the scenes, there was a lot more of kind of bipartisan sort of support for um, Ukraine sovereignty and independence. Um, and I think, you know, what the Biden administration is trying to do now 
it's not that dissimilar from what the kind of the sort of mainstream policy behind the scenes was uh, trying to do under the previous administration, which just kind of find ways of having Ukraine defend itself against Russia and, you know, basically be able to enhance its sovereignty. The problem is it's extraordinarily complicated because, you know, Russia really has Ukraine in its crosshairs. A lot of the stuff that's going on in Belarus is also about Ukraine, you know, hemming Ukraine in. And Russia has been making it clear, particularly with the annexation of Crimea, that it does not want to see Ukraine join NATO, associate mm -hmm. with the European Union. I mean, that was when the Crimean annexation came about. It wasn't because of anything we did, but because of Ukraine's aspirations to associate with Europe. And so, you know, our challenge is how to have Ukraine sort of stand alone and not be always a sort of an object of confrontation with Russia, an object between our, you know, kind of uh, difficult relations with Russia, because Russia always sees something as a proxy conflict. And also, you know, Ukraine being constantly defined by this aggressive uh, posture of Russia towards it. So I think we're going to have to be creative. And that's kind of where I'm kind of waiting, you know, to sort of see whether the administration will come up with um, something that's a bit different from what we've already had. Because there was a lot of continuity behind the scenes in policy, because we didn't have a lot of great ideas, to be honest, about, you know, how we can, particularly after the annexation of Crimea, about how we can solve this. Okay, here's a, here's a great ideas question from Roger Friedman. And he asks, the, the, the process that leads to the great ideas, based on your experience at the National Security Council, what works and what doesn't work? And, and that's an unfair question to ask for a short answer, but what, what's the short answer to that? Well, I think, you know, the, the most important thing is to kind of have willingness at the top, you know, to go out there and look for, you know, kind of creative solutions. And, you know, kind of trying to sort of figure out if you can articulate a general national interest rather than a personal political or partisan interest. And look, the great tragedy of the last few years is that our foreign policy has become the, the subject of partisan infighting, which it never used to be. Right. And so, you know, kind of we have to be able to kind of get back to have a kind of collective sense of, you know, what the United States posture should be it gets back to the other, you know, question we had about what would be a correct relationship to have with Russia. And a lot of the times, you know, we've been so bogged down in our own domestic politics that we can't then articulate coherent policies and then, you know, have a blueprint for collective action. After 2016, you know, what the Russians did, you know, Russia became a domestic issue. Mm -hmm. You know, did, did, had Russia, you know, kind of created the outcome of our elections, you know, what the Russians, you know, this, that and the other, you know, we, we became, you know, just this kind of collective hysteria about Russia and we couldn't kind of think about it from that, you know, very sensible question about what would be a correct or sensible, you know, kind of policy tab towards Russia. I'm saying my dog is scratching at the door at the back. I don't know if anyone can hear it, but it's just- yeah, let, let him in. You know, she gets scared and like, wants to come in. It's probably because it's, I, like, I'm trained to say the word Putin, she kind of comes to the door. Yeah. Um, we've, me, we've, um, we've had a fair number of dogs on this show. I know, I know, exactly. So I didn't know whether you could hear it, but I could. I was like, go yeah. away. <laughs> <laughs> so a dog treat in, the, in that direction. But I think, you know, that is kind of part of our problem is it works if we've got a kind of a sense that we're not at odds with each other. And that, you know, kind of, we're getting a, a, um, the space to be able to kind of talk about, um, you know, what makes uh, best sense as a policy. Because a lot of the things that we have to do in foreign policy, particularly when it comes to Russia or Ukraine, we also have to be able to do it with our counterparts, either our NATO allies or Europeans or others, Japanese, Indians, uh, you know, for example, there's an awful lot of other countries that have part of this. We have to be able to talk to them too. But when you have a kind of such a polarized domestic environment, it becomes very hard. I mean, look what's happening with Nord Stream 2 right now. That's become a kind of a, one of these symbolic issues where we have, you know, Senator Cruz holding up because of, you know, what the Biden administration decided to do, a whole bunch of appointments for key roles. That means you can't implement policy because if you don't, if you don't have acting um, people in place for a long time, they don't have the wherewithal to kind of go out there and, you know, serve our interests. And, you know, why is that all bogged down? Because we've made this a political issue where really we should be having a sensible issue saying, okay, what do we do about this? And, you know, kind of what would be a correct and sensible outcome? And if we can't achieve the outcome we want, what can we do to mitigate this situation? Who do we have to work with? And, you know, we had all these discussions behind the scenes about that under the previous administration, but it became, you know, so much of a sort of symbolic political um, issue for our own domestic politics or parties and domestic politics that we couldn't, you know, kind of always craft a coherent policy. So it works when we can do that. Can you talk, I, this is the last question, and this is, this is the, oh, okay. part, is, is 
Talk for a minute about your book. There's nothing for you here, finding opportunity in the 21st century. We, we were talking before we let the audience in. It's not really a book about Russia. It's a book about the United States and decline in the U.S. What brought you to this and why, why should we buy the book? Well, I hope you will buy the book and then yeah. get rid of kind of hide all the elaboration. But it, it actually was um, the result of my experiences at the, um, the testimony and the impeachment hearings. Because I went into the administration in 2017, deeply worried about what the Russians had done in 2016 in terms of their intervention in our um, politics. And, you know, I'd been the National Intelligence Officer previously, I mean, it had been some time before, but let's just say I knew a lot about what the Russians were up to. Mm -hmm. And although I want to seek engagement in the stabilization of relationships um, with Russia, I'm not, um, you know, kind of a, a anti-Russian, I'm not a Russian hawk, but I'm, you know, pretty mindful of what this particular group of people are up to, the security services and, you know, what they're doing. And this is, we've got to stop them, you know, from being, we can't do that by, you know, being weak and you know, kind of without shoring up our defences and we have to take some action. So I went in there thinking, okay, well, it's very clear what happened to me anyway. It's very kind of clear about what needs to be done. And, you know, though this was going to be controversial, I knew this was going to be, you know, from the point of view of domestic politics, this was going to be difficult. I kind of figured, getting back to my the last question, that, you know, we'd be able to cut through everything and get to the chase and get to the quick. And everybody would understand that we had a national security crisis on our hands. Guess what? No, <laughs> mm -hmm. we, were, we, were, we were, our domestic um, divisions had become so great that our national security was imperiled. Everything was politicized. You couldn't do anything sensible, talk about anything correct, but, but without it being, you know, given some, you know, political um, taint to it. The idea that there was this sort of deep state bureaucrats, you know, operating, you know, in opposition to the president, that everybody was a Democrat, that everybody was working for some conspiracy theory. I got, you know, kind of. I got hundreds of, you know, crazy, you know, um, uh, accusations about me on the internet. I'm not on the internet and social media, thank God, but death threats. And, you know, I was called a, a, a mole for George Soros. I was, you know, kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, involved in some massive great conspiracy to do this and that and the other. You know, I came away from all of this thinking, wow, we are really in trouble here. Not only are we, you know, dragging down our, we, we've been unable to get on top of the pandemic because of this, honestly because of the politicization of things that are just basically public health issues. We've, we're creating conspiracy theories of our own, uh, QAnon, and I mean, this is homegrown. I mean, the other countries used to do this, but we're doing it. This is nuts, you know, and I thought to myself, how did this happen? And I came to the United States in 1989, and I've seen the United States suddenly go on this path that other countries that I've spent my time studying have gone. And so I wanted to kind of get to the, the roots of it, and I had a pretty good idea of where it was coming from, because I grew up in the United Kingdom, I was born in 1965, in a whole period when the United Kingdom was coming apart at the seams. I mean, none of you will, um, you know, perhaps well, maybe some of the people on this will also have experienced this as well, but it was that massive collapse of the old uh, UK industrial economy. And you and I talked about this, uh, Charles, before everyone came on, you know, kind of Thatcher's Britain and the UK, the dismantling of the commanding heights of the nationalised industry, mass unemployment. I mean, in my own home region, 100,000 jobs were lost overnight. And this is a region of only 600,000 people, just to kind of make this clear. My relatives, everybody, all out of work. I mean, I grew up in poverty. My dad was a former miner, one job lost after another. I went to university. I was very lucky to go to university, the backdrop of the British miners' strike in 1984. The whole thing was falling apart at the seams. And you were getting the rise of populist parties, extremist parties kind of coming up there too. And Britain was just ripping itself to pieces. And then... I start studying the Soviet Union because in 1984, it's the backdrop of the war scare, you know, from the Euro missile crisis. And, you know, we're worried that we're all gonna be blown up. You know, so all of this gets comes trivialized by the idea of a missile strike and, and a missile exchange. All of you who are of my vintage will remember, you know, those war scares, um, the idea of nuclear Armageddon, the day after threads, all these movies about this at the time. So I decided to study Russian. I go off in a different path. And I get to the Soviet Union at the end of the 80s during the Gorbachev Reagan summits. And I think, my God, this is the Soviet Union. It's basically like my hometown of Bishop Auckland on steroids. It's falling apart. The, you know, the economy is you know, a disaster. There's nothing in the shops. They're boarded up practically because there's, there's nothing there. The whole Soviet Union is, is in an economic freefall and collapse. And then I spent my whole career early on in the 1990s looking at this. 
And then I start to see the same thing happening in the US. And although the United States, you know, kind of really turned itself around, you know, after the 80s in the economy, uh, in a general sense, you know, we have Silicon Valley and, you know, uh, you know, Atlanta and all kinds of, you know, big cities doing really well. We also have massive pockets of poverty and inequality and people without jobs and inadequate, you know, education and the skills, you know, to retool. I mean, my dad didn't retool, he became a hospital porter. He, he couldn't retool, there was no funding for that, but other people, you know, were able to. And you just kind of, we had this massive respite in the United States that has kind of also produced the same kind of populist politics and desires for something different. And it's fed into this partisan gridlock that we've had through, you know, various electoral cycles. It's had a long tail. And so basically the book is about what do we do to tackle this? Because we've seen it in other settings. I could have written about Germany and France and all kinds of other countries. It's a common phenomenon. And then how do we tackle it? So it's this crisis of opportunity of education and jobs and the politics that it produces. And so the book then tries to unpack some of the ways in which we might tackle it from experiences that I had in actually trying to help, you know, with various foundations and entities on reform in the Soviet Union and the former Soviet Union and trying to turn economies around, you know, back in the 90s and 2000s. In fact, we need to have, you know, some development perspective ourselves in the US. I think a lot of people are coming to that conclusion. I mean, I was actually, I'd almost finished the book when, you know, the inauguration you know, happened, although I had to shift because of some of the other developments and add some <laughs> different dimensions to things. But, you know, when Biden said, what's the, you know, number one value in the United States in his um, speech, I was like, fell off my chair. He said, opportunity, you know, because it's opportunity, the American dream, the chance to have a good job, to, you know, kind of improve your life, give something to your kids. I mean, it's that theme. It's why I came to the United States. I came here for opportunity in 1989, but a lot of people have come after me I don't mean people emigrating, but people born in the United States after me have just lost those opportunities. And that's what we have to kind of get back. Yeah, that was great. I'm, I'm, I'm going to buy the book. So thank you. There, is, there is a lot of stuff about Russia in it as well. And, you know, the UK and, um, you know, the kind of US and politics as well. So it's not a complete departure. It sounds great. Thank you so much. And, and, and thank you. Over the past 57 minutes, we have covered a wide, extraordinarily wide range of topics and just makes me want more. So I am going to buy the book and I urge everybody else to do so. Um, I've got three requests for our audience members. Number one is join your local World Affairs Council. If you don't have one, join the Atlanta World Affairs Council. You don't need to live here. You don't need to go to Aspen or Sun Valley or Davos to hang out with people like Fiona Hill. Um, all you need to do is join the World Affairs Council. This has just been tremendous. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's no charge and you will get um, notified every time we post a video of one of our programs. The one from today should go up sometime this afternoon in a couple hours. And number three, please pre-order Dr. Hill's book. Next week, the 17th, which I think is Wednesday, Tuesday, am I right? Um, Tuesday, yep. I just Tuesday. Yep, yep. <laughs> We've got a program, Edible Arrangements. This talking about opportunity. This is Edible Arrangements, the Power of the Entrepreneurial Spirit with founder and CEO Tariq Farid and Asma Farid, who's the VP and partner of Edible Arrangements. Uh, Tariq was an immigrant working in a flower shop who got the idea and started from nothing and now has got, I think it's 1,200 Edible Arrangements around the world. So this is gonna be great. Uh, and this is a joint program between us and the World Affairs Council of Connecticut. I wanna thank Agneska Block, who is the Senior Research Assistant at Brookings and helped us arrange this. Megan Torrey, the CEO of the World Affairs Council of Connecticut, who put us in touch with uh, Fiona. Our own staff, Aloran Lopez de Frank, the produ our producer, Laura Brower, our social media specialist, and Henna Rennie, our interim program director. And above all, I wanna thank you, Fiona Hill. This has just been a, a, a great hour. This has been fabulous. And um, I, I do, I, we're getting messages while we were talking, saying, are you recording this? I want to share it with my friends. I hope everybody <laughs> shares well, I, this. I would, love to, I would love to do this again. I mean, I just have to say I'm just a huge fan of World Affairs Councils because I think you, you have a, a, a massive impact. And I mean, that's kind of another part of our problem, you know, domestically is people don't realize how much international affairs affect them and how they can also, you know, kind of um, shape things themselves. I mean, we, this is um, a fantastic uh, forum for discussion.
And I love just, the way that, that you've all been networked together as well, because this is exactly what we need, working with World Affairs Councils across the whole country. And I'm just always very impressed by every event that I ever do with the World Affairs Council. Well, you just put your, your, your finger on, on all of our collective mission statement. I mean, that's what we try to do, is to get people to think not as Atlantans or right. Chicagoans, but to think more broadly about what's going on in the world and how it impacts each and every one of us. And so thank you so much, Dr. Well, thanks for having me. And I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of the questions. Well, it would have gone on for another hour and a half. So anyhow, <laughs> thank you so much. And, and I'll invite you to come back in a few minutes. Thanks a lot. Yeah. And thank you to everybody as well. I mean, I just, um, every best wish for the rest of the day and the rest of the summer to everyone. Great. Thank you so much, Fiona. Have a thanks, good Charles. Take care. Good Bye -bye. afternoon, everybody. Ciao. Bye.